Oh my goodness, you guys, this one is going to be so fun. And here's the thing. I didn't even really have to ask very many questions. Mary Keene is an author. She's a world traveler. She used to be in software. She has such life experience for us and so many stories that I, I, I can barely edit this puppy. I know it's long. I want you to sit down, get a cup of coffee, maybe a glass of wine, whatever does your thing. And listen, because the wisdom that comes from this woman's story is powerful. And I can't wait for you to listen. I know your deep, dark secret. You don't like your life. You're a woman in midlife. And for the past two decades or more, you've poured yourself in to other people. You've poured yourself into your career, your family, and yet on the inside, you feel broken. And that's no way to be. I'm Dr. Natalie Marr. I'm a clinical psychologist and a life transition expert. It wasn't too long ago that I was in your shoes, waking up in my early 40s, thinking I've got two failed marriages and I'm a single mom for the second time in my life. And I just knew that I could do better, that I could feel better. Fortunately for you, I have about 20 years experience clinically. And so I've created a method that will help you learn to love your story. I know that the story that you're telling yourself about your life feels awful. And I know that you think that you can't change that. I assure you, you can. And when we work together, I'm gonna help you to craft a different story, a story that you love, a story that makes you wanna get up every single day. Let me introduce you to Mary Keene. Mary is an author and world traveler who left her corporate software job in 2022. From 2002 to 2015, she was an endurance athlete, running marathons and finishing long distance triathlons and coach newcomers in the sport, founding a triathlon club. Through her guidance, hundreds of women were empowered to overcome their fears of swimming in open water, riding a bike on the road, running any distance, and daring to race. In the fall of 2022, Mary walked from saint jean pied de port France, to Santiago de Compostela in Spain, a historic 500-mile pilgrimage that has been continuously traveled for over a 1,000 years. Mary's experience in endurance sports and coaching proved invaluable in her successful completion of the pilgrimage, and she has been able to use that experience to help fellow pilgrims with advice and guidance. Mary is fascinated by all things ancient, with a particular fondness for stone hinges, burial mounds, and Templar churches. When she's not traveling or writing or reading about ancient landscapes, she can be found watching videos of archaeologists digging up pottery and bits of iron. She currently resides in Colorado with her husband, Jeff, who enjoys his own stone hinge and burial mound almost as much as his wife, Mary. So I hear I learned to love your story. The, yeah. My whole shtick is helping women in midlife love the whole of themselves. Take a look at like their whole life, love all of it, and use that as a sense of empowerment as they're stepping forward and choosing the life of their dreams from this point forward. And yeah. so I like to ask my guests, just tell us your story. Okay, well, uh, let's see. Uh, so I'll, I'll start with, there is a astrology chart, not that I'm huge into astrology, but I like to dabble in lots of things. I always find that fun, fun. And I think women in particular like quizzes. And so I think astrology sometimes feels like one of those quizzes, like, you know, what version of Barbie are you? And so, uh, there, so years ago I took this, um, this and it's free, but it's pretty, uh, comprehensive chart and then for an additional twenty dollars you could like pay for it it's all auto generated i'm sure and so you know i'm reading through it and what was fascinating about it was it said the first half of your life is going to be radically different from the second half of your life and at that point that was so true 
So the first half of my life, we moved a lot. Uh, we, my father worked, uh, well, first he was in the Navy and then we, he worked on nuclear power plants. And so he worked for Westinghouse and then Exxon. And so we lived in all over the United States, wherever there was a nuclear power plant, um, but also in Japan um, and Switzerland. Oh, wow. So uh, I really, I really thrived when we were in Switzerland. I remember that I was in, um, that was uh, fourth, fifth and sixth grade. Um, and I did really, really well. And then when we came back, we we to near where you are Pittsburgh, uh, yeah. because it's a big Westinghouse town, and so we were in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Right? I know my parents felt like they knew that there was culture shock, right? I mean, there 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 was no way not to have culture shock. I had I had been in Swiss schools when I was in Switzerland. I went to an Amer uh, uh, you know like an international school, so I was there mostly with Americans. Uh, very small, but when Switzerland, the, where we lived, there was no such international school. I would have had to get on a train every day by myself. I was fourth grade. Even my parents who <laughs> would wow. stick on a plane by myself um, and sent us off and whatever. Even my parents thought that was a bit much um, to go to Zurich. And so I went to school and I learned German and I could really fit in um, because of course I look Northern European. Every place ah. I'm in Europe, the people just assume I'm either German, Swiss, Irish, um, even in Northern Italy, you know, I'll walk into a store and people will address me. And so I just look very typical European. So it, it and then I came to Pittsburgh. <laughs> so um, I am sure Pittsburgh is a lovely town, but they had no idea what to do with me. I mean, at that point, I was starting to lose English. And so, you know, a German would come out. And of course, you know, it's kids, you know, teased. They, I was not bullied. I was teased, um, mm -hmm. which was okay. You know, I'm big family. We have, there's three girls, um, and I'm the oldest. And so by this point, um, uh, let's see, I'm four and a half years older than my middle sister. And, uh, she was born in Reading, Pennsylvania. And then my youngest sister was born in Switzerland and she's nine years younger than I am. So, you know, my mom had her hands full, you know, she yeah. moved back from Switzerland. Um, and so, you know, I was kind of, you know, figure it out. And so we were only there though for six months and I was just starting to get, you know, the whole hang of everything. And then my parents moved us to Florida <laughs> and so uh, I remember my parents just being baffled that I was just bawling about the fact we were moving. They were like, oh, we didn't think you liked it here. And I don't think they understood. I really didn't like moving. <laughs> yeah, I really didn't, you know, especially at that age, you know, and I am to go with your theme. I am very thankful for that now. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later, why that actually came in very handy later on in my life. But I just really hated it. I loved making friends. I'm very, um, once I make a friend, I'm kind of like a barnacle. You never lose me. <laughs> Warning. <laughs> I never go away. Never. <laughs> I'm never letting go. You're going to have to yes. me up. No, I'm yes, I'm a very loyal friend. <laughs> and so, so then we moved to Florida and, you know, the same, it was the whole cycle again, you know, totally, you know, baffled by, you know, everything, such a different culture, you know, finally started getting, you know, used to it, actually became a cheerleader, <laughs> you know. <laughs> very exciting. Um, and, uh, in, in ninth grade and, you know, was really fitting in. Oh, we're moving to the Seattle area. Woo! Okay. Let's go from as far away from Florida as you can get. It's like military brat kind of, but kind of, it's except different. They yeah. The same support that you get as a military brat. That sometimes, is true. Yeah. Sometimes I would meet kids who also moved a lot because their parents were in the military, but they went to like the base school and the base knew what this was like. And they gave a lot of support. We had none. There was no support like that. You just get dumped into whatever, you know, and my parents tried, you know, when we were in uh, Florida, they, my mother was convinced that we would do really poorly in public schools. So they, they put us in the only private school that they could afford, which was a Southern Baptist private school. <laughs> Yikes. Uh, that was, you know, another culture shock, right? And so- Totally. 
Yes. And uh, although I can tell you, I can match people uh, Bible verse for Bible verse. <laughs> I believe this. Yes. Oh, you yeah. can't get through a Southern Baptist anything no. without that. Yes. No, no. I have a really good grounding, you know, in Bible verses. Um, and so we uh, moved to Switzerland. I mean, to Seattle area. It was Bellevue. Um, very swanky uh, sort of uh suburb of Seattle. And uh, yeah, things were going well. And then my parents decided to move my last year of high school. And I, you know, I usually don't fight with my parents. You don't fight with Southern parents. I mean, you just don't talk back. That's just not allowed. Yeah. yeah. And I, told them I was moving in with the neighbors. <laughs> I was like, I was not doing my last year of high school in a brand new high school. So they figured out a way they made some kind of, uh, cause we weren't moving we were just moving out in the country. We weren't moving because we, oh, wow. we were just moving out in the country. And that was when I was like, oh, this, this move is not necessary. I don't need to be part of this. <laughs> I, don't, I'm, I opt out. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I, out. I'm out. Um, so they, they figured something out. And um, uh, so, but with all the moving and everything, I managed to graduate high school at 16. And so then I went off to college. My parents were like, yeah, you're just too young to go <laughs> and stay at college. So they made me they made me live at home for two more years. Um, but it, it worked out fine. And then I, you know, went to college. I met my um, then uh, what was to be my first husband. And uh, he had lived in New York City his whole life. Thought, we'll never move. You know, this man has moved one time in his life. He yeah. Went to University of Washington to go to school. That's good. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, anyway, we started moving. Um, so wow. then we, we moved to New York City. And um, it, again, very interesting culture. But by this point, I'm starting to, you know, learn how to like kind of roll with it. Right. You know, this is <laughs> this is my new life. I, you know, kind of get involved in stuff. And then. But New York was tough. It was really tough for a person who was used to taking a car to a grocery store. <laughs> yeah. Do that in the city. We lived on Fifth Avenue and 10th Street. I mean, you could not pick a better place to live in New York City. It was really, it was wow. very special. And we did as much stuff in New York City as we could possibly afford. Yeah, um, well, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> that's real. Work, he was working for NYU. It's not like we had any money, but he was working for NYU. And uh, we saw his parents a lot and his sister. And um, But then he got a job at UCLA. And so we moved to LA. And at that point, I started thinking, you know, okay, uh, with all these moves and everything, you know, first I'm changing everything in my life for my, my parents. Now I'm changing everything in my life for my husband. I have to do something for me. And I was trying to figure out what to do. I ended up getting my, my degree in business. I'd worked in PR in um, New York City, was not a fan. Um, went to you know UCLA, um, working at the chemistry department as an administrative assistant. And I'm thinking, what do I do now? And um, it was actually my ex-husband who said, I think you need to take an English class. Okay. Um, well, you know, just to keep busy, you know, they had extension classes. So I took one and the professor who taught it was like, you really need to think about going into teaching English. He said, but you know, like a, be a professor. And he was really encouraging. He was like, here's, here's what you do. You already have a degree. You just need to, you know, you need some more courses here at UCLA. And then, you know, you go on to get your PhD. Like, okay. okay. Um, so I thought that was great. You know, for the first time I actually had been like kind of a mentor, like trying to help me, you know, make this. And so, um, so I started taking the classes there and then we moved again. Uh, you know, we moved to Davis, California, which is outside of Sacramento. And, uh, but they, uh, Sacra uh, California State University, Sacramento had a good master's program in English. So I got a job at, um, UC Davis, uh, worked there and worked my way into an editor position and wow. wrote books on sheep, goats, and llamas. Um, how, yes, because uh, we were working in the program was working with uh, farmers in lesser developed countries and or now we call them developing countries. And they were, uh, it was all about sheep, goat, and llama um, farming. And so I wrote books on, you know, how to keep the male goats from having gay sex. Um, <laughs> eh? 
I, you know what, this is, we go to back. It's important to information. Somebody needs to know. Yeah, it was, you know, how to, you know, tell whether, you know, it's a goat or a sheep. You, you, that's, that's tricky when it's hairless sheep because they had hair, or, um, they had uh, hairless sheep in uh, Indonesia oh, yeah. because it's just too hot for all the wool, right? I get but, it. But the sheep are much more docile than goats are. And they were using them in the rubber tree plantations. And so they had hairless sheep. And so, you know, you have to know how to tell a goat from a sheep. <laughs> so yep. in case you're now wondering, it's uh, goat's tails go up, sheep tails go down. All right. Well, that's simple enough. <laughs> you learned figure. something new today. <laughs> now you will know. <laughs> um, so, you know, and I, I, I was getting my degree and things were going well and, um, yeah, you know, Davis just, you know, never really suited us. It was mm-hmm. kind of rural at the time. And um, and so uh, Frank, this, you know, he was looking for another job. And so I suggested Santa Cruz, uh, UC Santa Cruz. I love the ocean. I'm really, uh, a, you know, uh, a West Coast girl. Give me my yeah. and I'll be happy. And he got the job. And so... At that time, I was applying to PhD programs, and I didn't get into the one I wanted. I got waitlisted, and they told me that they thought they would have the funding, you know, for me the following year. So I'm like, all right, great. I've been an editor now. I write articles on go cheat to the llamas. Yep. Well, I can write tech stuff. Why not? So I got myself as a job as a tech writer in a very tiny company, 12 people, uh, down near Santa Cruz. And very quickly realized I was never going to make this kind of money as an English professor. <laughs> yeah, I believe that. It mm-hmm. really didn't take long at all. <laughs> so, yeah. And I really liked it. I loved it. Well, that's and, good. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I loved working with it. I loved the software. I'd always been the person in the offices who like set up the computers and got, you know, fixed them and everything else. I'd always loved it. We had, we got a Mac in January of 1985. Oh, wow. So, you know, I mean, one just of the, yeah. come out. I mean, we, I love computers. And so they asked me because my boss left and he was the head of engineering. He, they asked me, they said, so you've managed people before. You think you can manage any engineer, engineers? I'm like, sure. Not. So suddenly I was uh, the, <laughs> the manager of software engineers. And so I took some classes at community college. I taught myself how to code um, with their help. And that was now the next part of my life. So first part of my life is all about writing and, you know, sort of traveling for other people and moving all this other stuff. Now I'm in a place I love. I'm making friends. I absolutely adore it. And I have a job that I love. And so that is the next trajectory of my life until it falls apart. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it, you know, like everybody's, you know, there's ups and downs, right? And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, my uh, ex-husband was never crazy about Santa Cruz. Yeah, he's a New Yorker, you know, it's a little tough, you know, people wave hi you know, surf, you know, <laughs> <It's a little> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, uh, he wanted to move and I was like, oh no, I am not, no. moving. No, uh, no, not moving. And I, uh, but by this point I was also very heavy, much heavier than I am now. And I had always been a heavy girl and I had a doctor who insisted that I go see, and I had type two, type two diabetes by this point. I had developed that in Davis. And so I had a doctor in Santa Cruz who insisted I go see a nutrition. I'm like, oh God, they're going to show me fake food. I don't want to see fake food. She's like, no, I think this one's different. So I, she sent me off to her and uh, I asked her when we were going to look at the fake food. She's like, oh, no, no. She's like, I can tell you know all this stuff, but yeah. you just don't know these two things. She said, I want you to do two things. And this woman completely changed my life. She said, I want you to eat between 150 and 200 carbs a day. She said, I don't care if they're protein bars and all morning. And then the rest of the day you eat meat and salad. <laughs> she yeah. said, I don't care what it is. You don't, it's, it doesn't have to be broccoli. It doesn't have to be spinach. I don't care what it is because I was very busy. I was already very active and I was working out with a personal trainer and, 
And she said, and the other thing you need to do is what you're doing with that personal trainer, you need to do six days a week, one hour, six days a week, very intense exercise. I'm like, oh my God. And she said, you, that means you're going to find something you love. Because oh. that's going to be tough if you don't find something you love. Yeah, it she's was, not wrong. Yeah. No, <laughs> she's not wrong. She's not wrong because I really didn't like lifting weights that much, you know, which is what the personal trainer had me doing a lot of that. So I'm like, all right, well, um, I always wanted to fence. That always, you know, it's, I had this I had long history of reading and I loved, you know, the idea of being a knight and all this other stuff with swords. And I'm like, well, I could get, take up fencing and they had a club and I went. First thing that happened was, so first I walked in, it's all men. There's very few women in fencing. Um, and so I walk in and it's all men. And that was actually probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was to continue walking through that door because they were also all skinny. Mm. And I, but I kept walking in and I went in and they were very nice. None of the uniforms fit me. <laughs> uh, that they had the sample uniforms for the beginning class. And so we figured something out and so started fencing and I loved it. Absolutely loved it. And so I just kept doing it and I, um, you know, lost a little bit of weight, but then, you know, I was about to turn 40 and a friend of mine, she's two years, uh, her, her birthday's two months after mine. She was about to turn 40 and she's like, we need to do something epic for our 40th birthday. She's like, let's do the eco challenge. I'm like, no, I don't want to die. <laughs> I mean, people had died on that thing. And so I had walked a, a marathon with my sister the year before. And I was like, we could walk a marathon. She's like, no, oh, no, no, that's going to take too long. Now she's about as heavy as I am. So, you know, this is about uh, 80 pounds heavier than I am right now. And so I'm like, uh, uh, don't know that we can run um uh yeah yeah when was the last time you ran a mile but for both of us it was like in high school so we go to the bookstore because of course we're readers and we find the non-runner's guide to running a marathon and we followed that book religiously and we ran the Seattle marathon and one of the things that happened good was for you the weight just we could not eat enough it was, you know, it was everything that that nutritionist had told me about really sustained, long exercise. Trust me, we were not that fast. <laughs> we were very slow. <laughs> but it was just the length of time that we were spending moving our body. And we actually moved through that. We broke through the metabolic syndrome. It's basically. Yeah. yeah. And so, again, another change in my life. Now I'm a runner. And people keep meeting me. And I, you know, of course, as I mentioned to you, don't wait, uh, just wait. Somebody will tell you that they run marathons. They do triathlons, <laughs> all this other stuff. They're a fencer. Um, and so people would meet me and I would, of course, tell them that I had run a marathon and they were like, whoa, I could see it in their eyes. Well, hell, if she can run a marathon, I can run a marathon. I mean, if she can run a 10K, she, and, and so I developed like this little following of people who just started saying, well, hell, if she can do it, I can do it. I can do it. Yeah, yes, I can do it. And so, you know, there were people who started running 10Ks and, and I, and I started joining groups. Um, like I joined in these, you know, um, the triathlon club and I joined the, um, uh, the, there were two triathlon clones. One was women only, one was a, a mixed group, you know, started making friends with the fencing and everything. I mean, oh my God, it was so awesome. And my husband could not take it. Mm. He just couldn't take it. I was changing. I had friends. I was, you know, and I would have loved for him to come along with it. It was not his thing. And he was actually kind of mean about it. You know, like when, after I walked that first marathon, oh my God, that was the hardest thing I've ever done. And I've done an Ironman and I will tell you walking that first marathon was harder <laughs> than doing Yikes. that triathlon. <laughs> and then I called him, you know, as my sister and I are laying in bed with bags of ice on our legs. And I exactly. Think, he's like, oh, I did it. I did it. We did it. We finished, you know, it took an eight and a half hours for us to do it, but we did it. And he's like, yeah, you know, when I was in my 20s, I, I, you know, I walked 25 miles for the March of Dimes. It's not that big a deal. And it just really, it really broke my heart. Yeah. And it just, it just went downhill from there. So, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Mm-hmm. So we went downhill. And so uh, long story short, I ended up getting a divorce and, um, and I ended up moving to Wyoming, Cheyenne, Wyoming, because my, um, I, fortunately I sold my house right before 2008. <laughs> yes. Cause I had ended up with the house and I sold it. Oh man, I was lucky. And, uh, but my sister had had three kids who in four years, um, the oldest one had some wow. issues and, you know, I was flying out there a lot. I was working from home. You know, I, our, our sm- small company had gotten acquired by a giant company and, um, and so they didn't care where I was. Uh, and so I moved out to Wyoming uh, to help out. I lived two doors down from my sister. My parents had moved there. They were six blocks away. And so, you know, yet again, another huge culture change. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I'll, Wyoming. But you've like over this, you know, course of all this, like you've probably got a superpower in pivoting and relearning, yes. you know, the new nuances of the culture in a new place yes. and yeah. making it your home. It is. And that is really what then led to. So, you know, I was in Wyoming and, um, and I met this lovely man who was a retired uh, federal law enforcement <laughs> so totally different than anything I do <laughs> uh, I've yeah. never done before and um but uh he also turned out to be a psychic and a medium and oh trust me I, I cannot tell you how much joy I got at work you know yeah. all these software engineers all guys you know we go out to lunch or something like that and I just drop into conversation that my husband was a, a you know a medium and a psychic it's nothing like it. There really is nothing like the look on people's face. I can't even imagine. No that. one ever expects that, you know. So <laughs> you never expect the Spanish Inquisition. No, you never expect, you know, this this software, you know, person to, uh, yeah. So anyway, it was uh, anyway, lovely man. We and uh, but by this point, my company really wanted me to come back to the Bay Area. So we went back yeah. to the Bay Area. So another pivot back to the Bay Area. But I just at this point. I was not doing well at work as I moved up and I moved out of managing software engineers and that creative thing, you know, and moving up into administration, I ended up being a director. (laughs) I swear I was a director of meetings. That's what I, what I did. And I, it, um, I became very depressed. I was on a lot of, um, medication. My doctor was threatening to lock me up at one point. Um, and so, but I got the, the medication dialed in, mm-hmm. uh, but it was, it was tough. Um, yeah. Tough. And we, even being back on my beloved ocean and, you know, loving it, but, you know, then we moved again because it was just like the rents were going up and I was refusing to pay that amount of money for a shack. They wanted three quarters of a million dollars for a shack and it wasn't even anywhere near the beach. Um, and I was like, no, so I, crazy. it was, it was crazy. So, you know, we ended up out in Ohio because I was, I felt guilty about how much time my husband was spending with my family. <laughs> so we ended up there because that's where his family has a small farm. And so that was lovely for a year. And my sister was twisting my arm to go back. It's like, I can't do Wyoming again. So we uh, we came to Colorado. I was like, how do you feel about Loveland, Colorado? Because we loved Loveland. It's a very artsy community. It's uh, just south of Love- Fort Collins. Ah, and, okay. Yeah, so if you know where Fort Collins is. Yeah, I do. Where, yeah, they're melding together like many places, but it's still its own separate little, we, we live, I found a house that was just a short walk to the sculpture garden. We have like a world famous sculpture garden here. There's 187 sculptures. In wow. this, and it's like a mile walk around. It is that saved me during COVID because we I'm closed sure. our house the week that the country shut down. That's when we closed on our house. So, so we, lived, but fortunately, my sister and my brother in law, um, they ended up moving to Fort Collins from Cheyenne, and we, as a as a foursome and as a family, they got three. You know, she still has those three kids. Mm-hmm. Um, it was it was wonderful. I mean, I had family around. We are thirty minutes from the Rocky Mountain National Park, so we went hiking Beautiful. all the time. It was we are on lakes, and so paddle boarding. I mean, we it really was great. And yet, I'm still on medication, and so I knew. And I had said this repeatedly over the years, but nobody really ever wanted to hear me. And this is not true for everyone, 
But I knew in my heart that for me, it was my job. I knew mm. it was my job. There were many things about it. There were pe- there are people and there, there are people who have taken over my job who love that type of work. Um, but running, I had one week where I had 40 meetings in one week, 40. That is cruel. I think that's cruel. Like me. I like to sit down and work. Well, sometimes I'll sit down and I'll get up and I'll realize it's four hours later. <laughs> you know, yep. I yeah. love the flow and I love to think about things really hard. And I, although I love people on the introversion scale, I'm more on uh, on the other side of the introversion scale than on the gotcha. I love being around people, but then I need to go away. <laughs> yep. And so it, I knew it was the job. My hair was falling in and had been for years. Um, I, uh, you know, the metal, you know, I kept gaining weight again. I was back to gaining weight, even though I was still exercising, you know, it was like, so anyway, I kept calling the people who, uh, the, the financial firm who had my 401k and I would call them every six months. Can I quit yet? Can I quit yet? Can I quit yet? <laughs> they were so sweet. They were like, <laughs> you know, every six months we get on the phone, you know, get Jeff in here. We talk about finances and like, not yet, not yet. And so finally, um, I was, uh, I was going to turn 59 and uh, that year and I called them up and I said, can I quit yet? And they said, as long as you have health insurance, you can quit. You, you're good. This is doable. And Jeff, Jeff has health insurance because he's a retired law enforcement. Yeah. <laughs> he's got health insurance. And so I quit. Good. In a month, I was off of all the medications. And I am crazy. It is. I mean, I knew it was the job and I am working. Even Jeff will come up with money. You do know you're working just as much as you did before. I ended up such a different quality though. When you work for yourself and you're doing what you want to be doing, you're in like, you can't wait to get up out of bed to go do that thing instead of, I got to get through this day of things I have to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And my hair is growing back. <laughs> my, my, <laughs> okay. For women, that's a big deal. So if that's a huge a, deal. Yeah, if we a man is it it... now, you, you, you don't really understand. It is a really big deal. <laughs> huge deal. It is. Huge deal. It is. And it's, um, yeah, but when I was just at the hairdresser a couple of weeks ago and she's like, oh my God, you just have so much more hair. And it's been about, it's a little over a year now since I quit. And one of the things I told them, because of course they did try to keep me, I, God bless them, they did. But when I told them what I wanted to do, it pretty much, even, you know, I had VPs calling me, you know, I think it was going up like, please, please don't let her go. (laughs) Who else is going to run all these meetings for us? I know. Um, The, uh, you know, I told them, I said, I have plans. I said, I want to write. And I have this pilgrimage that I have wanted to do for 28 years. For 28 years in the back of my mind has been this pilgrimage that I read about 28 years before. And I really needed to do this pilgrimage. It kept calling to me and calling to me. And when I read Elizabeth Gilbert's book, what's the one about not letting uh, go of the ideas? Um, Be Pray Love. Oh, Big Magic. Big magic. Yes. Big magic. And when I read that book, which was a couple of years before all this, it scared the living daylights out of me that I was letting all of these ideas uh, for books and writing and this pilgrimage. It was, you know, I mean, it was, it had lingered for 28 years, but at some point it was going to go away. That call. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so strong. And so when I would tell them that it was like, okay, you know, I, they didn't even like, continue like trying to up anything. I mean, I think people realized that it was time for me to do something else. And so first thing we did was get in my husband's sprinter van. He built a little frame on it, put our our guest bed on it. So we had a queen size bed and that's it. (laughs) And boxes, lots of crates. (laughs) And we left for two months and we drove around the East coast and we visited a lot of family and we went to, I really got into this kick about ancient civilizations. And so we were going to see every ancient city that we, you know, especially um, like Navajo, the Pueblo people and so on. But there are ancient ones in like the mound people in, um, in the middle of the country. And so yeah. 
we went to Poverty Point, Louisiana. And, you know, my husband, he's like, cool. We're like, it's a bump in the ground. That's awesome. He's so sweet. He's like, we're really in the middle of nowhere. Poverty Point is <laughs> nowhere. And, uh, but, they, you know, there was like a couple of mounds still left. It's a 3,000 year old city. I mean, it was just, I was just in heaven. So I was doing that. And, you know, I'm writing about that. And then, you know, we um, we come back and I start planning for this this pilgrimage. And I walked over 600 miles around our town of Loveland and Fort Collins in Colorado and up in the Rocky Mountains. You know, I'm I'm doing all this stuff. I'm, I've got the backpack on, you know, every couple of weeks I'd add more weight to the backpack. I'm trying out different clothes. And now I've got the hat. I've got the hiking poles. People think I'm weird all over Loveland. <laughs> But there were some people <laughs> that I met because they were like, okay, you're obviously doing something. What exactly are you doing? And, um, you know, I tell them. And so I actually made a few friends along the way. Yeah. They yeah. Like on the walk and um, which was great. And, and so, uh, yeah, August 31st of last year, I got on the plane and I flew to Paris. And one of the things that had happened over that 28 years, I'm sure you have probably gotten the idea now that if I can run 40 meetings, I am at heart a project manager and I will mm -hmm. project manage everything to death. Spreadsheets, oh my God, I love spreadsheets. Uh, so I will take everything. I have, I have, you know, every day I start with a to-do list. Uh, I know you've seen the to-do list. I have seen your to-do list. has to be checked off. But for some reason, I never researched the pilgrimage. I didn't. I had read this. Uh, it was actually a book review. And it was a book review of a guy who did this 28 years ago. It's now 29 years ago. And uh, I read the book review. I never read the book. But I once I knew Interesting. about it, I was like, I have to do this. I have to do this. And he had started in France. So I was going to start in France, you know, because... I did get the the guidebook. <clears throat> there was this uh, very famous guidebook that does uh, what they call a stage. His suggestion of how long you walk, and he gives some details about it. You know, like elevation gain and stuff like that, and some of the things you'll see. But that's that's about it. Um, but there are a lot of books about it. There's lots of um, things on the internet, blogs. Um, there's a forum. Uh, and fortunately, I did actually look at the forum a couple of times before I left and, you know, realized that I probably should. My my plan had been to get off the plane and go directly to the town where I was going to start and then start the next day. And people on the forum, other people had had that thought and they were like, you really need to take at least a day to kind of acclimate to, you know, because you're talking about an eight hour time difference as well. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so I spent the night in Paris and, you know, of course, uh, being me, I decide I need to walk around. I need to go down and see Notre Dame because, you know, they're rebuilding yeah. it and all this other stuff. I walked over nine miles that day. I just got right after getting off of an airplane. Okay. So, yes. Okay. I'm an idiot. And and some friends. Are you were just zealous. You were excited. <laughs> That's all. Exactly. So I get off of the, I, you know, so I did realize when I'm down at Notre Dame and I'm having something to eat and I'm looking at, you know, my Fitbit and I'm like, Ooh, okay. Nine miles. Hmm. Okay. I took the Metro back. <laughs> I did not. So the next morning, you know, I, I had figured out the train system the day before. So got on the train and, um, you know, ended up in this small town called Saint Jean Pierre de Port, and it's a very medieval town. And that's where, if you're going to start and, and you're going to climb the Pyrenees first, that's where everybody starts. You go to a little pilgrim's office, and they tell you what to do. And and I stayed in my first hostel, and I had made a reservation because that's what they said on the forum. Make sure you make a reservation for the first night and then for the second night because everyone starts in Saint Jean Pierre de Port and goes to Roncesvalles, and there's one monastery there. <laughs> so mm -hmm. make a reservation. They were also starting to talk about how because during COVID. Uh, you know, Europe really shut down even more so than we did. And a lot of, uh, the, you know, you could, a lot of uh, hostels had closed down. Uh, they just couldn't support it because people weren't coming. And also because of nobody had done it for two years and the Pope decided that it was going to be a holy year. So the holy year was actually technically in 2021, but he extended it to 2022 because of COVID. Now a holy year 
is you're Catholic. Yep. You may understand this. So yeah, Catholic, means a lot of people will be coming to do yes, that pilgrimage. Yeah. Because in theory, if, I mean, this was a big deal. So this pilgrimage has been going on for a thousand years ago. And so people uh, in old days of indulgences, <laughs> If you did the pilgrimage to um, Saint uh, to Santiago de Compostela and you finished, you would get half time off your time in purgatory. Yeah. If you do it during a holy year, you get full time off your time in purgatory. Now, the Catholic Church doesn't talk about this anymore. I happen to know this because, of course, I'm a fan of history. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, but the holy year, even though they don't talk about it, and I don't think a lot of Catholics even know about it anymore. Um, it still draws people out. Yeah. You know, the whole year it's a big deal. And so, so anyway, they went from in 2019 before COVID about 200,000 people did the pilgrimage and that was yes. considered a banner year. The year last year in 2022, over 400,000 people did it, which meant people were competing for beds, especially. Yes, people, uh, especially for beds. This was, and with some of the hostels that already closed down, there's even less beds. So it was kind of crazy. I and, am sure. Yeah. So I, you know, got, um, I, it, uh, I was so excited though. And I didn't quite n understand this yet. I mean, people didn't know quite how much, but on the forum, they're talking about how many people are out there and how people are really struggling to find beds and stuff, but you don't really realize until you're there. And now I had not done any research, remember? So mm -hmm. I, all I kept telling myself is the minute I step on the path, everything will be easy because it really truly is. You just get on the path. There are way markers everywhere and you walk west. That's what you do. Yeah. Just keep walking west until you hit Santiago de Compostela, about 500 miles away. And uh, so I wasn't really worried about anything. You know, I figured I'd, I'd work it out as I went along. Because remember, I've grown up all over the world, right? I have a smattering of, front of Spanish because my husband's Spanish. I don't okay. know. Okay. No. <laughs> yeah, he's Spanish. And, you know, we lived in Germany. So I can speak. German and I, you know, I've got a smattering of French and, you know, and heck, I grew up on airplanes, right? Back yeah. when kids did not, we were yeah. using to get on an airplane. Um, so, you know, I wasn't worried about it. You know, I trained, I knew what I was doing. All right, get the backpack on. First hostel is interesting, you know, and, and the guy was very, took his, his job as a host very seriously, you know, like made sure we all understood, you know, like there's some rules. You can never put your backpack on your bed ever. This is how they're keeping the bed bugs down. Yeah. It, yeah. You're just not allowed to put your backpack on your bed. And, you know, there was other things you never walk in with your shoes on, you know, just other things. And my first hostel and it was great. My problem at this point is I can't eat dairy. France was a challenge. I can't eat gluten or I shouldn't. That's actually going to have to change. Um, <laughs> there, are, I can't have coconut oil. I can't have tapioca. Um, you know, there's wow. There's so many things that I couldn't eat. And I was really nervous because I didn't really want to get, you know, sick on the, on the pilgrimage. And so at this point, I actually haven't eaten a lot since I arrived in Europe, especially France. They put cheese on everything. God love them. <laughs> so... Good but cheese, but still I, cheese. I knew that Spain was not going to be like that because my husband's from Spanish. I know Spanish cooking. I'd been to Spain before. I knew that cheese is not a big thing over there. So I wasn't too worried about that. But I was at a hostel dinner when they hand you what you eat. I didn't know what was in that soup. You know, was it full of cream? Was it, you know, is it you know, so I'm really not eating a whole lot. And this is really partly going into, and it's hot. It is so hot. Now, I live in Colorado. The summers here are hot, but they're dry. Yeah. It's so humid at this point. It is now like September 2nd, but it is still so humid. And so get my backpack on, step out onto the pilgrimage. Oh my God, I'm practically vibrating. I'm so excited. And I walk for about three minutes and a man stops me. <laughs> God. And he's this Australian guy. He's wearing the most 
colorful shirt I've ever seen. And he's like waving at the pilgrims and stuff. And he comes over and he proceeds to capture me for like 20 minutes and talk to me about, he had done the pilgrimage before he was going to start his, the next pilgrimage uh, the next day. And I'm going, why is this man? He already knows what this is like. Why is he like talking to me for 20 minutes here? Yeah. And finally extricate myself. But he had to tell me about this one magical spot he made me take a picture of it with my phone on his phone. So I'd know where it was when I got there. Okay. So I start finally. Okay. Interrupt it, but start again. Oh, I like to, pre- I like to think that he saved me from something. I don't know. There were cars. Yeah. On the road. Maybe somebody would have hit me. Maybe, maybe, you know, you don't know what's going to happen. So I like to think that maybe he was an angel in disguise. We don't know. So I start and it is rough. It is so hot. So hot. And it is so humid and it is so steep and my backpack hurts. And I'm just like, this is not what I thought this was going to be like at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, it, um, it was a rough climb. I did meet a few people and that kind of what kept me going, but I, you know, and I'm doing my best to stay positive. You know, this is the pilgrimage. I'm starting to worry that the whole pilgrimage is going to be like this. And um, I finally make it into that monastery and I walked in and I burst into tears. I mean, I was just sobbing. And this kind Dutch woman (laughs) comes over. The whole place is being run by Dutch volunteers. This is the funniest thing. I mean, okay, random. All right. Um, But she comes over, she takes me aside. First, she makes sure that I have a reservation. Now, I don't understand why at this point that this is such a big deal, but I'm like, yes, I do. She's like, okay. In between my sob, sits me down, gets me some water, takes my backpack off, you know, tells me to take a break. And I, and the place is packed. I mean, there's all these pilgrims coming and I had thought I was the only person left on the mountain. Oh no, there's people still coming and coming and coming. And so we, uh, just as I stand up, she comes over. She's like, are you ready to go? Can you check in now? I'm like, yeah, I think I'm good. So I stand in line and they close the place down to anybody who didn't have a reservation. So all those pilgrims that are now standing in there and still coming. Yeah. uh, Now they did a great job. They did organize taxis for them. They called other places. They they made sure that they had a place to sleep. Um, But I was lucky. And so um, got my pilgrim dinner of a piece of trout, little trout. Mm -hmm. Tea, which of course I took a picture and sent it to my sister because she doesn't believe that people actually serve fish in Europe with the heads on. Of course they do. They always do. Um, yeah. And uh managed to get, you know, get some sleep, but I'm just really worried about it. So I made a reservation for the next day just in case. I didn't know what was going on now. So that was the first day. And uh wow. What would be your advice to women having gone through this? really epic experience of following what nobody else believed you know, hair's falling out. You're still on medications. You still just can't make your life feel like it's an alignment and you knew it was the job thing. And then you did this crazy thing where you fly across the world to go walk for 500 miles (laughs) and write a book about it. Thank God. But it is like, what, what would be your, your wisdom to impart for women who still are feeling stuck? in their life. Yeah. And it's easy for me in some ways. I don't have children, you know, I mean, I have nieces and a nephew um, who I adore, but it's not like they need me every day. Right. I mean, this is much harder for somebody who um, has kids or Mm -hmm. doesn't have a husband who has health insurance that, you know, so, so I do know that I am very, very blessed in a lot of ways because of that. And so I could do these things. I would say, so this weekend I, I was at a, I was helping to run a teenage uh, girls camp um, about, it, they were exploring their careers, mostly with technology and so on. And there was a woman who came to speak. Um, she wa- um, was a retired journalist, um, had been, you know, like pretty high up in journalism and she was talking to the girls and it turned into a lecture to the girls to make them be very cautious. And I was so gritting my teeth at this point. Mm. 
girls get this speech all the time. You know, women do too. We are taught to be afraid. We are taught to be worried about our surroundings, who, you know, stranger, stranger danger, um, all these other things. And I think we get enough of that. I don't think that when you're, you know, 12 and 13 years old, you need yet another woman standing in front of you telling you stories about stalkers. Um, and I know that she had a horrible experience with a stalker. It does not mean that all these girls will. And I would say, I mean, first of all, I would love for women to get more bold and mm -hmm. stop being so afraid. And if you are afraid to learn statistics, there are a lot of books out there that will tell you that the statistics of things happening to you are very low, very low. <laughs> yep. I mean, it's it's amazingly low. I mean, you have a much greater chance of dying in a car accident than pretty much anything else happening to you in your entire life. Yeah. And I would love for women to start understanding statistics because, yes, I spent 500, you know, I was in Spain, well, France and Spain for two months. I was staying in different hostels with hundreds, sometimes thousands of other people around me. And yet I was not afraid for my safety. One, because I'd been to Spain before and Spain is in terms of violent crime, really low. I mean, yeah. Okay. Pickpockets, you got to watch your wallet, <laughs> but the people there are like anywhere. I ever, people in general are just kind. They look out for you. When I lived in New York city, I lived in New York city for two years in the eighties. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> New York City was not the prettiest place in the world <laughs> and people were scared. I never had a problem. You know, I mean, people, tourists flocked to me because I was the only person who would ever smile at anybody in New York City. <laughs> and you know, so even though they didn't know that I wasn't from New York City, I guess somehow people knew. And so, you know, and I always had a map in my, my, in my bag, you know, and I actually had, I, Back then, getting a hold of a subway map was like gold. And I had got, <laughs> um, and so I could like tell people where they were going and how to get there. And it is the same way for every place. I have always been very blessed by people. So after the three days in the pilgrimage, I came to a, a, a large town, Pamplona, and um, I had met some people who happened to be doctors who made sure that by this point I was not feeling well. And, and a lot of it was because I was dehydrated and I wasn't eating. Um, and so they made sure that I stayed in a hotel with some air conditioning and I spent an extra day there and I lost my phone. Now, my phone has not only my phone, but it has my credit cards. Um, it had some most of my cash and it had um, uh, ATM cards and my uh, my vaccine card, which, you know, is a big deal. Ooh, that's, a big deal. that's yeah. a big deal. Yeah. And my driver's license. So Ugh. I did still have my passport. And I now know people in Spain. Um, and also, you know, I could have called on my ex-husband's um family you know i mean i i was i would have been okay and i reminded myself people walked this a thousand years ago without a phone yeah <laughs> yeah without anything um and yet i got my phone back hmm. there were so many people in pamplona who made sure i got that phone back now part of it was my husband who has a very creative brain um and when i called him to tell him what happened, he started sending text messages to my phone with the name of the hotel and the phone number and saying, if you find this, please return it. And the phone, uh, the hotel got a call about 45 minutes later that had been found and it was at the town hall. Now, in between all this, I had gotten lost on the bus. I got on the wrong bus, going the wrong direction. And all these women were helping me, the hotel clerk, you know, they, they, I mean, nobody ever charged me for this phone call back to the United States to my husband <laughs> in the hotel. I mean, there are so many wonderful people out there if you just let people help you. And that mm -hmm. is what I would really love for women to understand. We're, we're so trained to be cautious and afraid and, you know, um, especially strangers. But if you think about yourself, how do you react? You know, how yeah. do I react? to a stranger that needs help. I mean, yeah. part of it is, you know, I, and I've lived in big cities. I've been in San Francisco. I've been in New York City. I've been around homeless people. I've been around people who think they're God or Jesus or Napoleon or whatever. Um, and yet, 
even as a as a kid, I always somehow picked up this thing. When I look at somebody, the first thing I think to myself is, this is a child of God. Mm. This is a child of God. No matter if they're screaming that they're Napoleon, that doesn't mean I'm going to go up to them and give them a big hug. Yeah. But if you train yourself to remember that every person that you interact with is a child of God, it doesn't mean you have to get close to them or anything else like that, but it does really change your interactions with strangers. And yeah. You know, and you just at some point have to assume that it's if you have any type of religious background at all, you have to trust that God or Allah or you know um, Shiva, whatever, whatever one you believe. Yeah. In. Um, and I'm actually more of an animist than anything else. I believe that there is spirits in everything. Rocks. I talk to rocks. Um, mm -hmm. Why not? Yeah. Um, I, Why not? I, I mean, exactly. I, yes. But I mean, it's more like, you know, if you believe that God is in everything and every person, it really does kind of change your outlook on what's going to happen. Yeah, it does. Yes, bad things can happen. I fell. I had to walk 135 miles with a broken tailbone. Oh my God, that hurt. And it turns out later that I, it was actually also a torn labrum in my hip. Okay. That hurt. But there were so many people that helped me through that and came to my aid. And I have yep. these wonderful people now that are totally great friends. And that is what I would want for everyone. I would want yeah. that for everyone. So yeah. just to shift their orientation from being fear-based yeah. in their life and yeah. cautious and yeah. following a path that they know is tried and true and set forth for them, you know, versus like seeing the interconnectivity of all things. We're all God's children. Right. We're all, you know, yeah. part of this big universe together. And there's as much to be grateful and appreciative of, grateful for and appreciative of as there is to be feared, if not more. And so orienting yourself there and having that be your true north on your compass is helpful rather yeah. than to be guided by the caution itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and and listening to myself. I mean, I did let myself for years be led by the money that I was making in a tech job. Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. You paid me a fortune to be on those medications. Uh, and, yeah. and I love the people. The people also are terrific people. I mean, I absolutely adore the people I worked with. And um, it's the work itself. And so I should have left years before. Um, and I should have, you know, it's just one of those things that, you know, um, remember the whole thing. I, th I don't know if we were recording at the time, but I told you that I'm like a barnacle I'm yes. very loyal, and I mean, once I make friends, I don't leave them. <laughs> <laughs> and so that was part of it. And so I would say that with everything that we've talked about, I am still that same person who was depressed in that job, you know, mm -hmm. even though, you know, I have. I have this background and, you know, and I, I meditate and I do all these other things. The job still was just not the right one for me. It wasn't creative enough. It didn't allow me enough time to think um, deeply about something. And so I would say that part of this also is you're just going to sometimes have to go against the flow. Yeah. The number of people that told me I was insane for leaving this job a, a, it, and, and I could understand from their, their viewpoint. I mean, you know, it paid really well. I lived in Colorado. I didn't have to go to the office, you know, it was, and yet it just wasn't the right thing for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you honored, you stepped into that and honored that yeah. and used the privileges and gifts and blessings that you have to be able to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah. 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 It's been a pleasure, Mary, having you on you when know. you, you know, do decide what this next book is all about. Yeah. Um, and we want to come on again. I would be more than happy to have you. Thank you. Now yeah. It's such a pleasure. Thank you for being Thanks. such a wonderful listener. You're welcome. That's what I do for a living. <laughs> Wasn't that amazing? Mary will be on again. Mary has many more books that she is going to be authoring. And she and I just cannot stop talking about all things fun and nerdy and ancient and whatever, whatnot. So you'll definitely get a little dose of Women Empowering Women with Mary Keene again. Oh, wasn't this such a great interview? I really enjoyed it. And I really hope that on your path to learning to love your story, it helped you too. 
All right. So I'm adding a little addition here. It's the legal stuff. Just so you're aware, nothing in any of these podcasts constitutes actual psychotherapy. Yes, I am a licensed clinical psychologist in the state of Minnesota, but everything here is just educational in nature and is a suggestion of things that you could be doing in your own life to learn how to love the life that you're in instead of waiting for a life that you're dreaming of to come towards you. So just remember, this is not therapy. And if ever you need any resources for mental health, look in my notes and I'll always have a little blurb at the bottom where you can click on a link and get those services for yourself.